York, my beautiful, gleaming, wounded city. When I was a little girl in Oklahoma, I'd wait every week for Newsweek and Life magazine to plop into our mailbox. What were people in New York City doing this week? They were going to plays written by Europeans. They were listening to jazz and string quartets, all the things you were not supposed to do in Oklahoma. I thought you probably needed a passport to get into New York. I, I had this vision in my mind of, of people lining up at the bridge, paying a fee for admission. I was right. <laughs> I hit New York when I was 17, and I never really went back. Stone by stone, I built my life. A pre-war apartment on the Upper West Side. Rent stabilized. <laughs> Filled with music and books. A husband who liked opera more than football. Two charming children in good private school. An interesting job. Up. Ah my career. I, I started out as a young woman, traveling to Latin America and writing about the dirty wars. I was a brave, foolish, 25-year-old girl, yes, girl, although I would have fought that word at the time. I saw bodies, talked to refugees, dodged bombs. The only time I was really afraid was on the night before I got on the plane to go back down, and I'd cut my deal with God. I would say, if I got killed this time, someone would have to feed my cat. <laughs> of course, this was before I had human dependence. After a few years, I, I burned out. I settled down. I made my mother very happy. <laughs> and when I got my normal life, my apartment, my family, it was like a gift. Every time I took a hot shower, I was so grateful. <laughs> Eventually, I stopped reporting. I found work as an editor. I became theoretical. Where were you, September 11th? Question of the year. I was at home getting ready to go vote for Mark Green for mayor of New York. How many times did I vote for Mark Green? It was like the Catholics in their weekly obligation. <laughs> <laughs> the phone rings, and it's my father in Oklahoma City. Is your TV on? No, I want to say. Only people in Oklahoma have their televisions on first thing in the morning. No, I say. Why? Plane crashed through the World Trade Center. Must have been one of those little planes. Pilot had a heart attack. Dad, I said, maybe it's terrorism. He thought about it. Why would someone do that? So I turned on the television and I joined the witnesses of the world. I called my husband who works on 31st Street so he and all of his co-workers could go watch out the window. Now, 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 now this. My dad calls from Oklahoma so I can call my husband so he can watch it out the window. This was the end of the postmodern era. <coughs> So we all, in our assigned places, watched the second plane hit. We watched the towers go down. And then, because I, I don't know what else to do, I go to the corner polling place and vote for Mark Green. Mm -hmm. The week after the attack, I visit my sister in Park Slope in Brooklyn. She lives in Park Slope because she's 10 years younger than I am. And in the intervening 10 years between us, the Upper West Side kind of priced itself right out of the market. I like Park Slope. It's more like my neighborhood used to be. They just had another kid, three months old, and I needed to hold that baby. It was primal. That week, you could have scored big in the rent-a-baby trade. <laughs> the phone rang, my sister answered. It was her friend, the masseuse. Park Slope, you have friends who are masseuses. You meet them at the bookstore, coffee shop, or in poetry readings. <laughs> this friend was giving emergency massages to rescue workers. Look, she said, I, I've been working on this guy bad shape. He's a fire captain and he just lost most of his men. He's got to give the eulogies and the first one is on Thursday and he, he doesn't know how to do it. He's the, he, he needs a writer. Well, I said, when was the last time I heard somebody say they needed a writer? This is when we were all just discovering our own crisis of marginality because everyone, everyone wanted to help. But we couldn't. They didn't want amateurs wandering around the site. They didn't want our blood. 
Even the surgeons felt useless. A friend of mine went to volunteer. Plumbers and carpenters first, they said. Intellectuals to the back of the line. The firefighter needs a writer. I called him. He lived down the block. I said, come now, I said. I have a few hours. My sister took the baby out for the day. I knew exactly what to expect. Fire captain, big guy, take charge attitude. Joan? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm really very, very sorry about what happened. Oh, yeah. Look, I, I feel badly about, about this. It's a beautiful afternoon. It's a weekend. You should be with your kids. You don't need to be doing this. My kids have play dates. I'm useless. No, it's fine. Come in, come in. Make yourself comfortable. Sit over there. Can I get you some coffee? Uh, yeah, sure. If you have some, go. Uh, cream and sugar? Just black. Oh, good. That's the way I take it to. services are scheduled so far? Oh, I've got a list here. Uh, yes. Bill Doherty, he's first, that's Thursday. Then Jimmy Hughes, he's next week. After that, there's Patrick O'Neill. That's a real hard one. My best friend, what, what a fine man. His wife wants to do his on his birthday. And the next day is Barney Keppel. Ooh, Barney. Everybody loved Barney. Guys are going to take that one real hard. So that makes four that we need to do today. Well, we'll just try to set the time. Uh, Thursdays? Thursday, yeah. Uh, Bill Doherty. Uh, Catholic service? Uh, Did you talk to the priest? Do you know how long the eulogy is supposed to be? Oh, not too long. Uh, four minutes. Uh, five minutes. No, not even that long. There'll be other people talking too, but the families want me to say something. I'm the captain. Yeah, save it. How can I explain it? Hey, it's okay. 
Human beings have been giving eulogies for thousands of years. You are doing this for the families. You'll comfort them. It's for them. It won't be about what happened that day. We'll talk about the guys. We'll, we'll make it about them. That's what you can give the families. I keep hearing all these speeches <laughs> of the politicians on TV, the pictures in the paper, hero this, hero that. I don't even recognize them. So that's why it's good that you're doing this. You can give their families and friends something they can recognize. You can do that. So hey, uh, tell me about Bill. Bill. Yeah, Bill. See the problems? There's just not much to say. Just hero stuff like they were some guys in a movie. But Bill, he wasn't like that. He was just an ordinary guy, a schmo. If Bill walked into the room, nobody would even notice. You can't say that for eulogy. Hey, it's okay. Don't worry. We'll do this. I mean, people who are ordinary in an extraordinary situation, that's what this is about. Now, back up just a little bit. Tell me about him. What did he look like? Uh, when you think of him, what comes to your mind? Looked like, uh, he looked like a plumber. A big guy, reddish hair, mid 40s. But he was a senior man. All the junior men relied on him. They had their eyes on him to know what to do. My men, he called them. When you close your eyes, where do you see him? What is he doing? Um, in the kitchen. The kitchen? The guys spend a lot of time in the kitchen between runs. There's a lot of downtime. Bill's there saying, I'm looking out for my men. My men need this. Yeah. Bill spent a lot of time talking. He was real good with the younger guys. He was always taking them and pointing things out to them. Uh-huh, yeah. See, someone like Bill, he's real senior. He's been there 16 years. There's always new guys coming through, and sometimes they can be a pain in the ass. They're a little nervous, and they don't know where things are. A guy like Bill could have blown them off, but he was looking out for them. Here's the gear. Here's the tools. Here's how you handle it. No, not like that, but like this. Was he a family man, religious? Oh, Bill was quiet. Never talked about himself. Half the company didn't even know he was married. I know he went to Mass, but he never made a show of it. But he was proud of being in the Irish blood. He loved New York, all its nooks and crannies. You know, these guys see the city from the outside, the inside, underground, and in all hidden places. Bill wanted to know the history of everything. I remember him telling me, Nick! just got this great book, a walking tour of Flatbush Avenue. Flatbush Avenue? You want to have a guy like that around, especially downtown. With all these crazy streets, nowadays you get a computerized map when you get a call. Somebody can still call in and give you bad directions or a building name, no address, or no entrance on the side of the street. And there's all that. And that day, I still don't know what happened. I can't find anyone who saw the company. They got off the apparatus, the apparatus in the office and told the driver, we're going to Tower One. They're running down West Street in full gear about the time the second plane hit. Maybe they peeled off and went to Tower Two. But we don't know where to look for them. What else did Bill love? Any sports, music? You said he hung out in the kitchen. Did he cook? Uh, oh, Bill wasn't exactly a cook. The guys took, take turns making meals for everybody. Sometimes it's okay, but it can get pretty bad. I call their cooking valiant attempts or physical play. <laughs> yeah? Every guy has his specialty, and they usually cook it every time it's their turn. <laughs> We're talking pink and undercooked chicken and nasty ugh, rice and roll. <laughs> Bill would sit there and try it and come up with some real singer. So he was more of a critic? Yeah, yeah. He was a firehouse food critic. And he could zap them good, good. But not me. He was never me. Okay, okay, this is good. This works. Because you know, Nick, you want to give people someone they recognize. Not just a plaster saint. Now this is good. Now wait a minute. 
I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm not giving you anything to work with. I, I shouldn't be doing it. No, 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 no. Just wait, just wait. Okay, try this. Uh, start here, and it jumps to there, and, and if you could read it out loud so I could hear it. I'm Nick Flanagan, captain of Ladder Company 60. I've worked with Bill Doherty for a long time. I want to give my condolences to all of Bill's family here with us today. Okay. We've been hearing a lot about heroes, and Bill was one of them. He gave his life for others, and that is a noble thing. But Bill was a quiet hero. Never one to show off, and never flustered. He was a firefighter for 16 years, and he was a good one. He had the most important quality for a firefighter. He was absolutely dependable. Yeah. yeah, that's right, dependable. Over time, we realized how important he was for the newer guys at the firehouse. Sometimes he could be hard for the inexperienced men to show the young ones the drills year after years. But Bill was always looking out for the new guys, showing them the ropes. And he did it in that quiet way of his. Never made them feel small. My men, he called them. My men. Yeah. You got it. You got it. That's it. They're your words. I, I just put them in order. No. He was like an older brother to them, looking out for them. They appreciated it. I appreciated it. You got to have guys like Bill to go to strong team. They might not say much. They hold things together. If Bill hadn't been a fireman, he could have been a food critic. Bill used to spend a lot of time in the kitchen talking to the guys and evaluating the cuisine. When Bill tried out a questionable dish, he could come up with some real zingers. The restaurants in New York are lucky. He went into another job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, look at the final work. You got it all. What did Bill love? He loved his family. He loved his city. On September 11th, he was the senior man. The younger men could look to someone who was steady and professional to show the way. We know that Bill and other firefighters in New York saved thousands of lives that day. That means that there are thousands of people and their family members who are able to go, go on because of them. And only thank them and ask for God's kindest blessing for those they have left. So, it, it works? You got it. I can do this. I'll have this in front of me when I get up there. It's something to give them. Are you okay? Are you okay? That was what we kept asking each other. Pretty much the rest of September. What was the answer? The pebble is dropped in the water. The point of the entry is you, yourself. Were you present at ground zero? Were you wounded, suffocated, and hurt, or covered in white ash? No? I guess you're okay. The first ring around the pebble, is your family okay? Did you lose someone in the towers or on the planes? The next ripple, friends. Are your people okay? Next ripple, if someone died in the tower that you had dinner with once and thought was a really nice person, are you okay? Next, you look at a flyer of a missing person in the subway and you start to lose it. Are you okay? If all the flyers are gone one day, Are you okay? Is anyone okay? That first week, I bought a coffee at Starbucks on the way to work. And the guy at the counter handed me my cup and said, here's your change. God bless America. I took a breath and said, are your people okay? And he said, only two missing. Only two. <coughs> And I said, 
I hope you can find comfort. Only people from Oklahoma talk to service and coffee shops. But at least there you can say, God bless. Here you don't know if they have a God or if you have a God or if anyone has a God, it's the same God. They want the same thing. We all travel in our track. Neighborhood job, friends, parents and your children's friends. No matter how big a city gets, the only way to live in it is to live in your village. You get to a certain age, the next person you meet has a logical connection to the ones that came before. Friend or friend. Nick and I weren't supposed to meet. You couldn't create another sequence for his life that leads to me, or for my life that leads to him. After September 11th, all over the city, people were jumping tracks. Jim, what can I say about Jim? He was a new guy, still on probation. I hardly knew the guy. I never even got to see his family. His girlfriend came down to the firehouse last week. Nice girl. Said he was a bicycle racer. The bike club out in Flushing had a memorial for him. Put flowers on the handlebars and everything. That's all I know about. How long was he there? Oh, he was only with the ladder company for a couple of weeks. He had been with the engine company for seven weeks before that. That's what they do with the probies. Seven weeks engine, seven weeks ladder. But when they flip them to ladder, they come into my office the first day. We shake hands, then we might not see each other for a while. Ladder? The ladder company. See, there are two companies side by side. The mission of the engine is to put water on the fire. They've got the hoses, they work like a team, and they get it where it has to go. Ladder, we do ventilation. Entry and search. So your engine has the ladder thing? No, no. You call the engine an engine and the ladder a truck. Yeah, the big ladder, sure. But a lot of other things too. All kinds of ladders. Suitcase ladder. Oh, beautiful. It pulls up so so you can carry it like a suitcase. Axis, electronic sensors. You got the forcible entry team that breaks down the doors so the guys in the hoses can get in. Engine and truck, we work out of the same firehouse, and sometimes we hang out together, but we don't know all each other guys the same way. I see. So Jimmy just got there. What was it like for him? He had to learn fast. He was willing to learn. He was always, show me more, show me more. I think he had a lot of friends who were fired. How old was he? Uh, I got it here. 24. Um, what kind of things did he like? What, what did he look like? I don't know. I just don't know. He wasn't there that long. With everything that's happened, this is terrible. This is a terrible thing. But I have to tell you right now. I can't even remember his face. <laughs> We'll do this. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, now, you say that they come into your office on the first day. Yeah, they do. <clears throat> they come in and I shake their hands and I say, Welcome to the company. This is the best job in the world. Two weeks before this happened, I shook his hand. But I didn't tell him he'd be dead. You didn't know. So how was he doing on the job? I'm not real sure. He was still learning. I mean, if he was screwing up, you would have heard about it, right? Oh, yeah. I always hear about it if they screw up. Uh, I didn't hear anything like that. So he wasn't screwing up. <laughs> he was doing fine. He went through probation, and every guy goes through probation. We can put that in there, too, right? Yeah. So how does that work? Well. First, they got to take the test. And then there's this brutalizing physical and paperwork. Lots of paperwork. Piles of paperwork. And then they go home and wait. Long, long wait. They think it'll never end. Most of the guys get rejected. If you're lucky, you get the calls. This is fireman so and so. Come on down. You're in. Yeah. And then what? And then you. 
and start. And you sit down, keep your eyes open, and shut up. Right. <laughs> what are the senior guys like with the new ones? Well, you know, they show them around. Some are more patient than others. They give them a little bit of a hard time. Not exactly hazy. It all goes with the territory. Jimmy was doing fine. He was a regular guy, low-key, well-liked. He came in uh, the same time with another probie. Hippolito Diaz. You can't say it, but I love it. <laughs> you got to love that name. Where do they get these names? <laughs> Sounds like a ballpark. Now I'm batting for Jorge Posada. Hippolito Diaz. <laughs> Hippo's missing too. He's missing with the guys from the engine. So they started in the summer, right? Was it a long, hot summer? What, what was it like in the firehouse in the weeks leading up to it? Oh, nothing special. Some little stuff. You know, false alarms, waste basket fires. The guys were a little restless. This was the day. They were chomping at the bit. This was the day they were waiting for. So Jimmy hadn't really been in many fires before. No, oh, this was it, September 11th. This was his first real fire. Of course, everyone has their own description. Myself, I favor the idea that it's like a massive boot stomping right here. Knocks the wind out. Heartbreak sounds too deaf, too fragile for this sensation. It is a body blow. And then you just can't breathe, not really. Not for a long time. Brain chemistry for dummies. Lesson one, the science of pain. Cortisol is released in response to stress. It is sometimes called a stress hormone. A variety of psychological stressors can cause cell death in the nerves affected by the cortisol system. Cell death. Don't like that. Trauma causes anatomical changes in the brain. Stress can change the neural architecture, the hard wiring of the brain. Diminished blood flow to the brain causes similar brain cell death. And so does normal aging. Well, that explains a lot. <laughs> Put simply, we've got nerve fibers running through our brains like lines strung on telephone poles. Our brain sends out electrical chemical messages that lead from pole to pole. And then when we experience devastation, trauma, toxins spill out. God, can you imagine what it looks like in there? <laughs> when monkeys are subjected to severe forms of stress, they show signs like passivity, cries of distress, and behaviors like huddling and rocking. The animal model seems to say that pain has its price. The victim carries his scars. All right, Nick. Try this one. I'm Nick Flanagan of Ladder Company 60. Yeah. Honor the memory. Condolences. Okay. Yeah. Oh, now, now, okay. now. Jimmy's job was to learn as much as possible, as fast as possible. We could tell he was going to be good. He was quiet, <coughs> helpful, and hard working. The guys liked him, and they're a good judge of character. Yeah, this is on that morning in September, Jimmy was going out on his first big fire. He was serving with the cream of the crop and he was holding his own. They were ready for this day. It was the work they had chosen. <coughs> the work that was about risking everything, risking your life in order to save others. In our grief, let us remember that. When Jimmy first came to the firehouse, he came into my office and I shook his hand, telling him what I tell all the new men. This is the best job in the world. Now I would say, this is the most important job. 
I'm sorry, maybe that might be not right. No. The best job in the world. Can I say that in front of his folks? It's true. I've been doing it for more than 20 years, and I can't imagine doing anything else. I believe you. These guys, you just won't believe these guys. Uh, more coffee? More coffee. Yeah. Here you go. I'm sure it's a little cold by now. You should try the coffee at the firehouse. It's really bad. <laughs> I'm accustomed to drinking bad coffee. No, I mean really bad. <laughs> I, I don't usually drink it this late in the day. It, it is getting late. Hey, I should be getting out of here. It's your weekend. You, you've got plenty of other things uh, you need to do. Nick, when we were talking on the phone, I thought about what I was going to do this afternoon. Nothing more important than this. But next week, once I'm in the office with the kids and everything, then it might be hard to get back. Let, let's see what we can do today. Uh, Patrick. We got to do Patrick. The thing is, I think I'm, uh, what do they call it? Denial. In denial about Patrick. I swear. I'm sitting in the office and the doors open. I think he's going to walk in. Uh, Patrick O'Neill. Oh, Patrick. This man had a full, full life. This man always had something going on. His work, his family, his church. I say to him one time, what are you doing this weekend? And he says, going to the church picnic. I didn't even know they still had church picnics. Kids? Four. Christy, she just got married. I think she's 25. The twins, they're 14. And Teresa's 10. Wife Mary Rose, he's got a birthday coming up. And he's going to be 47 next month. How long was he with the company? Patrick came into the company as a brand new lieutenant four years ago. I got to see this man grow. When you're new, you're shaky about everything. But over time, I saw him grow. He had conviction. That was the thing about Patrick. He knew this was the job for him. He was sure he could do it. That's what makes a leader. The troops heat it up. So the men looked up to him. Oh, yeah. They wanted to follow him. That's the difference between being a boss and a leader. Patrick was six weeks away from taking his captain's step. No doubt about it. Are the men ever afraid? afraid. People are afraid, but they never admit it. You can't admit it. Everything would fall apart. You can't afford it. They need someone to follow them. Good decisions, calm under fire. I don't like the cowboy hotshot type, I never did. Cowboy. When I think of him, I think of when I was in the Army Infantry. They got this motto, follow me. And they did. That morning, too. What picture do you have of him? When you think about him, what do you see him doing? Oh, I see him walking. These giant strides. He's not going to stop this train. He could cover a room in two steps. Yeah. I see him leading five guys up to a building, sizing it up. First thing he does when he gets to a fire, walk around and size it up. And these five guys behind him running to keep up. And all the time they're listening to him, thinking, what does he want? How do we do the job right? How does he motivate them, love? Criticism or praise? Oh, there's lots of praise back in the kitchen. They kept an eye on them, too. Especially the new guys, the probies. This one's good, he'd say, if he liked them. Don't try to put anything over on him. If you got a square rooter, Pat picked up on that right away. He knew. Square rooter? Yeah, that's what we call them. A guy that just scout for himself. You know, an operator, me times me. So Patrick was a real straight arrow. Oh, yeah. Work, church, and home. That was the model. He was a real role model for the men. Last year, when Barney Keppel had a little run-in with the law, Patrick 
helped him out. Arnie goes to him and says, Okay, Lieutenant, from now on I'm a new man. Work, church, and home, just like you. He must have liked that. Oh, yeah. He didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Not for a minute. Barney was work, church, and home, at least until Friday, or maybe Thursday. <laughs> that was okay. Barney didn't mean any harm. He just got into scrapes. Him and Dave. Oh, Barney and Dave. Ooh. So Patrick <coughs> talks a lot about his kids. Oh, yeah. It was always, I got Frankie's soccer practice this weekend. Going to meet Christy's in-laws on Sunday. Tonight we're going to Teresa's recital. This man had a full life. One day he says, I made Waldorf salad for the church picnic. You got to try it sometime. He goes to the church picnic. I tell you, I didn't know they still had church picnics. Well, I can't say that I've done any lately. <clears throat> Nobody's having any fun anymore. We're all walking under this cloud. But there was something last night, a tango wedding party. No, really. I, I went to a tango wedding party, only in New York. East Japanese, she's a blonde from California, and they met at their tango club in Central Park. <laughs> the party was in this restaurant down on 38th Street. The whole place was done up in white and silver with candlelight. They had a little tango trio, real Argentines. And they played, and after dinner, people danced. Ten couples, the bride and groom. Oh, they were really good. You know, tango, that's a difficult dance. And the women were all dressed up, with their hair up, wearing little high-heeled shoes with pointy toes. We just don't see that anymore. And when they got going on the dance floor, their feet just flashed. It was so beautiful. It was like a dream intermission in the middle of all this. And there was drama, too. On the 11th, the groom was flying in from the West Coast, and the bride was working downtown. And there were hours and hours when each one thought the other was dead. But they weren't. So they had this incredible evening, and it was beautiful. They were beautiful. They made us all beautiful for a few hours. Um, I dance, you know. That's my big thing. You dance? Really? Yeah, I've been taking lessons for years. I, I don't do the competitions. I, I just like learning new stuff and perfecting my steps and the people. Oh, people are great. What kind of dancing? Lots of kinds. Swing, ballroom, tango is the top dance. That's really at the top. Very difficult dance. You can study tango for a long time. You like to dance? Oh, I like to, but my husband doesn't, so I don't get the chance. But watching them made me want to. Their teachers are there. I never saw them dancing like that before. Usually you don't get to dance with your teachers socially. But once we were at the party and my teacher said, yeah, come on, let's do it. What an experience. You looked at her and it was all there. The dream, she was perfect. You can't make a mistake when you're dancing with perfection. <laughs> The frame? Yeah, the frame. It's, it's the uh, invisible box you're standing in and how you hold yourself inside. <laughs> oh. Like if you uh, push your partner's hand. Here, give me your hand. You see, if you push and it's like cooked spaghetti, uh, that's, that's not good. And here, give me your hand again. If you push and there's some resistance, you've got to feel your body move in that direction, oh, chop, 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 right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's good, yeah. I see. And if you're lucky, it all comes together. When people move in sync, sometimes it's real hard for these modern women, you know, the professional, they're educated, and they're, well, they're used to being in charge. But when you're dancing, you've got to be able to follow. You've got to be able to feel the lead. You've got to let go. Yeah, that's not so hard. Just follow. Here, like this.
He just gave my hand that little push, like the demonstration of cantilever. It was all proper. I never even got up from my chair. But after that touch, whenever I watched him, I noticed how light he was on his feet. I, I could imagine him moving quickly and usefully across a landscape of flame and broken glass. I could see him in a dance class, swinging his partner, smiling as their steps snapped and synchronized into place. I could see Jimmy Hughes <coughs> crusting a hill on his bike, and Patrick O'Neill with his kids and his salad at the picnic. It made me wonder what I thought I saw every time I walked past a firehouse. I never thought about a kitchen back there. I knew then that every time I saw a person on the street, I saw only his public shadow. The rest, the important part, lives in layer after layer beyond our view. We have no idea what wonders lie hidden in the people in our midst. Nick, where were you that morning? At home in Brooklyn. When it happened, I went outside to the street. I could see the towers on fire. You were off duty? I wasn't doing it until 6 that night. We worked <coughs> shifts. Patrick was on that morning. You went to the firehouse? I made an entry in the log at 10.15. I got there 20 minutes after Tower 2 went down. The engine and truck left at 8.52. We got a video camera at the door with a time clock. You see them go out. We lost 14. Eight from 60. Truck. Six from the engine. Two survived, both drivers. One driving the engine and one driving the truck. The last thing Pat said was, we're going into Tower 1. You see, there was a real stupid thing. You know the big orange? plastic cones they use for traffic? Well, the ladder truck ran into one on the way, and it got wedged under the fender. You can't go anywhere till you get the cone out. Steve, the driver, he's out there wrestling and cursing that cone, and it just wouldn't come out. So Pat says, come on, guys, we'll go on in just a couple of blocks. And Steve can meet us down there. We're going to Tower One. Steve finally gets the cone out and heads down. He makes it to the lobby of Tower 1. He's trying to find out where the company is. And then he's blown out of the Tower 1 by the collapse of Tower 2. He's blown. Clear out of that lo lobby. Getting that stupid cone saves his life. An orange plastic traffic cone. We still haven't found the guys. I don't know where they are. Maybe after the second plane hit Tower 2, they went there. I just have no idea. I keep trying to figure it out. We can't figure any of this out. It's too big for us. People used to have religion. Something terrible would happen, and they'd say, oh, it was God's will. But we don't buy that anymore. God's will, this was not God's will. There is no reason. No explanation. Yeah, no reason. I say to Pat the night before, do you want to work first floor or second floor? We do this all the time. We trade off, and always before he has a reason. I'll take tomorrow. You take today. No, you take today and I'll take tomorrow, he'd say. I got my, my daughter's soccer practice. I, I got this, I got that. There was always a reason. That day he just said, oh, I'll take it to you, Marty. This time he didn't give a reason. There's no reason. I'm alive and he's dead. I don't even really know why. I lie awake nights thinking, what was the reason? No reason. Nick, this guy sounds too perfect. I mean, he must have had some flaw. Come on. Flaw? Well, I guess he was a perfectionist. Okay. Used to drive him nuts if something wasn't working right, if something was messy, if he saw the probies loafing around the firehouse. Do something useful, sweep or something. Or if they were sitting in the kitchen, he'd say, Don't just sit there, read something. That was my Okay, is that a flaw? But at least it's human. We have got to make him human. I tell you. 
every day at the firehouse. I still think he's going to walk in the door. Tell me what you think of this. I want to offer my condolences to his family who are here with us today. It is impossible to think of Patrick without thinking of you. Even when he was working all out, Patrick always had his family in mind. That's the sense I have. Yeah, that's, that's good. Patrick was a fine father. It was a quality he brought to the firehouse. He had that calm presence you look for in the leader. Follow me, he'd say, and they would. The men looked up to him for the way he did his job, but also for the way he lived his life. Work, church, and home. That was his motto. Well, that's what Barney always said was Patrick's motto. I don't know if that's what Patrick said was his motto, but no, no. It sounds good. Patrick O'Neill was a big man. He covered the ground in long, shore strides. When he went out to a fire, he had uh, he led the way. The older guys and the other guys had to walk down the hall just to keep up. That's right, I was one of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He took special pride in the new guys, the probies. He expected the same sense of purpose in them that he had in himself. If one of them was taking it easy around the firehouse and Patrick walked in, he had better find an emergency room. That's good, an emergency room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's Patrick. On September 11th, Patrick was six weeks away from taking his captain's test, and there is no doubt about it, he would have aced it. When I think of Patrick, I think of the infantry motto, follow me. I'm sure that's what Patrick said that morning when he got the alarm. Follow me. With his long stride that gave so much confidence and purpose to his men that day. And I don't care whether Patrick ever took that captain's test. In my book, he earned it, and Captain is the least of it. Patrick O'Neill was many things to many people. Leader, friend, brother, husband, father. And none of us here will ever forget him. That's, hey, what, oh look what I've done. I, come along and I've unloaded all this stuff on you and now you're a wreck too. I, I have no right to do that. <coughs> no, no, you don't understand. You're hurting me. This, this hurts you. This is nothing. Less than nothing compared to what's happened to you. This doesn't mean that you should suffer. Can you use this? Yes. 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 Now I have something to say when I get up there in the words. They're the right words. But that doesn't mean I should drag you into this. You are on the outside of it. And I if you can use it, that is all I ask. Was I outside of it? I don't want to be. Not so far. This is my city, too. I can't just watch it on TV. I want to do something. But this is all I know how to do. Words. I can't think of anything else. That's OK. They're your tools. People need to tell their stories. I know you absorb some toxins listening to the pain. It's like the print of a hand in raw clay. Even the people who tell the stories know this. In Chile, some people who were tortured couldn't tell their families what happened and caused the listeners too much pain. The people didn't want to hurt anyone with their stories, but they needed to tell them. So some shrinks gave them tape recorders and had them tell the machine. It helped. You know, when it first happened, I would wake up every day cleansed of the memory. And then they, these fresh moments after sleep, and I'd remember, and another thought would resist. No, 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 that's absurd. But the first thought would win. Yes, it happened. And now I have to go through another day living with that reality. I thought, it would be good to get away. So when they asked me to come to Argentina, I said, yes, I was meeting with some Argentine writers. They told me what it all meant. The United States is living under total military censorship, they said. What? The military won't let the newspapers publish pictures of the bodies. Wait, wait, I said. 
the newspapers is still trying to figure out what happened. What happens next? Pictures of the bodies? There aren't any bodies. Do you want pictures of pieces of bodies? Censorship. Now that's when information is blocked. They are not blocking the information. We know they're dead. People don't need pictures. People don't need pictures. There's one woman in Argentina. Her son was one of those who disappeared under the military junta in the late 70s, early 80s. She told the newspapers there that when the plane hit the tower, she felt glad. We all know who was in those towers, she said. American imperialists had them coming. I wanted to tell her they were civilians. They were massacred. And if there's one thing that we have salvaged from the bloody 20th century, it is the idea of human rights for everyone, even Americans. Now, it may sound strange to talk about Americans as victims of human rights abuses, but strange things happen. I couldn't wait to get back to New York, where everyone understood. But I kept thinking about it. I realized that everything the Argentines were saying was about their own war 20 years ago. They thought it was about them. Everybody all over the world was talking about it, writing about it, and they all, they all thought it was about them. But it's not. It's about us. Right? <coughs> it's getting dark. Yeah, we are rounding the bend. You're tired. You're fried. I can tell by looking at you. That's done. Uh, one more. Did you say there's uh, one more service schedule? Barney. Barney and Dave, they're like two wild men, but they haven't scheduled Dave. Okay, Barney, well, tell, me, tell me about Barney. Oh, Barney. Everybody loves Barney. He and Dave are always getting into trouble. Yeah. See, these two guys had escapades. Always together, you know. Barney wasn't even supposed to work that morning. He just came down to the firehouse to meet Dave. Dave, oh. You wouldn't want to live next door to Dave, oh no. He had this house on Long Island. Yard full of old cars, he loved to mess around with wreck. The more wreck, the better. So one day, Dave hears about a 69 Thunderbird convertible in Wyoming. I'm going to go buy it, he tells us, and off he goes with fun. These guys go driving their beat up old T Birds cross country. They're supposed to be back at work, and we keep getting these calls from South Dakota and places like that. Don't worry, Cap, we're coming, we're on our way. And afterwards, they tell us a story, one of those firehouse tales in the kitchen that gets riper every time you hear it. So they, they fixed it up? Oh, yeah. Barney was a real great metal worker. He could do anything with metal, with a big sense of humor. He had this banter that kept you rolling. His jokes were pretty bad, and he wouldn't tell the same tired old one-liner over and over again. But somehow, he always had everyone in stitches. Maybe it was the way he thought of them himself. This was a guy that you loved. Popular. Okay. Well, yes and no. Yeah, got to understand, this was a guy in his mid-30s. He still lived at home with his parents, an older couple. German. They never called him Barney. Bernhardt it was, his mom always said. Bernhardt! Very orderly, very precise. Barney was like that. He had his own private workshop at the firehouse. He had all the firehouse welding. He had all these tools. He collected old tools, machines from the 20s and 30s. He'd bring them in. Nobody knows from where. Nobody knew where they, what they were for. Big things, real presses, all kinds of blades and stuff on them. Barney would tackle that old machinery, take it apart, clean it, make it look like new. And we still don't know what it was for. <laughs> My dad's like that. Yeah? Huh. And you know, up above the bench where he hung his wrenches, every tool had a spot on the wall with a, a, a drawing, a silhouette of the tool. A 
It's that German precision. How can you get along with Dave? <laughs> Dave's yard was a mess. Dave moves in next door and the property values go down. That's what <laughs> What's your party look like? Oh, you know, tall, uh, light hair, kind of beefy, not exactly. He, he and Dave would go out drinking and try to meet some nice women. But Marvin never had much luck. Marty would say, if you could only meet a woman welder, <laughs> that was a girl in his dreams. Whenever Barney met a woman, the guys would say, yeah, but Barney, can she weld? <laughs> Flash dance, that was his ideal woman. <laughs> was he a good fireman? As a fireman? I thought he was real. He was a man who worked with his hands and his tools. Asked questions. He knew what was going on, analytically. He was interested in everything. He took his talents and used it for the company. Can you give me an example? Oh. Okay. We have this generator, power source. Took two guys to build it. Hearst tool. You use it for traffic accidents. Hearst tool? For horses? Hearst. H-U-R-S-T. Sometimes they call it jaws of life. But it's a Hearst tool. It's got these big jaws for cutting through metal. But it needs a lot of power. Generally, it weighs a ton. It's really hard to move around. So Barney takes his paper ticket, whips it out, whips it around, and he fills a brand new hand cart for it and fits right into the truck compartment on wheels. One guy can handle it on his own. No sweat. Sounds ingenious. We didn't even know we needed it. <laughs> Nobody asked him to do anything. He just thought of it, and I did it. He could have been an inventor. Oh. He was a great inventor. Everything this man built was made out of metal. It was made right. You send him to the hardware store to buy something and say, nah, it was too clumsy. He'd make it himself. And he made it to last. His bench is bolted to the floor. You can't move that thing. One guy transferred into the company and he brought this rack. Well, you rest barbells on it. And he put it up in the workout room. All the guys used it. He gets transferred out and he says, I'm taking my equipment uh, with me. Barney looks at Dave and says, Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> so Barney goes and wells it all together. <laughs> you can use it, but you can't take it apart and you can't get it out the door. <laughs> that thing will be there forever. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, the guy could do about it. I mean, he relished it. He was bad. Everybody else was on duty, but I wasn't sure about it. <laughs> he wasn't on duty, but he never called in. The whole time I was getting all the other parts, part of the distinction. Where's Barney? What happened? Well, time went by and we remembered the videotape from the security camera at the firehouse. As we watched the tape, it was almost 9 in the morning, and Barney pulls up in the van and gets out. And he's there talking to Dave. You see the screen on the sidewalk suddenly filled with papers. The company's go, Barney and Dave go. You see them turn in helmets and equipment. And they, they just walk away. <coughs>
and love for this place. It will come back. I am Nick Flanagan of Ladder 60. I'm here to honor the memory of our dear friend and brother, Bernard Temple. I want to offer my sincere condolences to his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Keppel, with us here today. I hope that these few words can give you some sense of how much we thought of Barney and the light he brought to our lives. Some days I could almost go without thinking about it. But to really pull that off, I'd have to avoid the newspaper, not watch TV news, not do a lot of things. Not hear a siren, not smell smoke. What can I tell you about him? He lifted your heart. He had an unstoppable sense of humor. He was fun. He had a happy laugh. It rose out of him and took you along. But Barney's humor was natural as breathing. But Barney also had an art, a metal worker's art. He recuperated things. There was nothing he loved more than fatigue to metal. I get angry. How do you cut deals with God under these conditions? Barney was a genius with metal. He could weld it, bend it, bolt it, drill it, you name it. And then he brought in creativity. He noticed something around the firehouse that didn't work very well. Something we just took for granted, and he'd think up a solution like the huge generator, the Hearst tool that's mounted on the grid of the car. One day, Barney builds us a specially designed hand that fits right into the compartment. He fixed something before we even defined the problem. That's the kind of guy he was. I know my terms. I realized it the other day, getting on the subway. I want them back. I want them back. All of them. That is all I will settle for. I want them back just the way they were, together again, and that is final. We depend on our tools. They're all important. When you go out on a call, sometimes you break through metal, sometimes wood. You need different tools. When you're answering an alarm, every tool counts. I'll tell you how it could work. I read about it in a book. Let's just play the tape backwards. Start with the shot of the roll. The dust and the steel rise and untwist and form back up into the buildings. The flames are sucked back into Tower 2 and then Tower 1. The planes fly backwards across the river, take a curve, and land backwards in Boston. Everybody gets out of the plane and drives backwards home. But it's also how you use the tools. Barney sets up his own workshop at the firehouse and it's a bit of beauty. A tool for everything and every tool in its place. He built the workbench himself and built it to the floor. I can tell you, that workbench isn't going anywhere. If Barney built it, he built it well, meticulous. Barney had a unique talent, and he used it for the betterment of the company. He was a man who worked magic with his hands, respected his tools, and respected his job. The department can't ask any more than that, yet he brought so much more. He made us smile. And he still does. Just thinking of it. He made us laugh. He made us feel good about who we were, about working with each other. The guys from the ladder truck run backwards. Barney's there. He's next to Dave. This time Jimmy's in front and Patrick's in the back. They all get into the truck, back up. The orange traffic cone falls out into the street, and the truck backs into the firehouse. Barney gets into his van and he backs off home. That's it. That's the deal. I just, I just have nothing to bring to the table. But trust Barney to leave us something more perfectly too. His careful hands built things to last. The tools he built for us are still in the firehouse. They're western. They're anchored. They're welded. They're bolted. They're grounding us. We use them every day, and every time we touch them, we are grateful. Share this life.